Dr. Israel Likoi is a lecturer and assistant professor in environmental science at the School of Biological Earth and Environmental Sciences, University College Cork. His research areas include soil and environmental microbiology, soil health, sustainable agriculture, and plant microbe interactions. He has also worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Limerick at the Irish Agriculture and Food Authority, TIGASC, and a research fellow at the University College, Dublin. Obviously, you will agree with me that <laughs> we will need to contact Dr. Israel after now <laughs> to give us a therapy out of the food scarcity. <laughs> <laughs> That's on a lighter note, though. So, uh, without wasting much time, uh, ladies and gentlemen, doctors and professors in the house, intellectual minds and scholars in the house, please join me and let's give a flower to our guest speaker, our facilitator today, and the person of Dr. Israel Koi. You're welcome, sir. Thank you very much for having me. I hope we can hear me clearly. We can hear you, sir. Yes, right. we can, sir. Yeah, starting on the notes you said, um, incidentally, last year in March, I was at the University College Dublin when the Irish ambassador to Nigeria visited all the African researchers in in Dublin then, and I was having a conversation with him on how the government of Nigeria can partner with the Irish government in terms of agriculture and food development, because if you talk about the crisis with the herdsmen, um, one of the areas that the Irish government have done very well and excellently well is in the area of pasture management and um, he took on the idea i don't know what happened whether maybe when he had discussions with the ministry of foreign affairs in nigeria maybe they didn't like it but there are several opportunities that the food uh, security worldwide can be helped and research is going on in that area Thank you for inviting me, and uh, on that note, I would like to share my screen. So, the title of this uh, talk this afternoon uh, is Post-PhD Scholarship Opportunities. Uh, we would not call it scholarship at this stage we'll call it post phd or postdoctoral fellowships see scholarships are different from fellowships scholarship is where you are paid stipend but in this case as a postdoctoral uh, fellow or candidate you get paid salaries so uh, for the very uh, next moment, we'll talk about what opportunities are available, what they are, how we can assess them, and having uh, been an applicant myself and also sat on interview panels for these positions, I will also give you some insider information on how to prepare for these things. So first, let's look at what post-doctoral uh, fellowships are. So uh, just to give you an overview, a postdoctoral position or fellowship, often referred to as a postdoc, is a a temporary academic appointment that some academics pursue after earning a doctorate. 
once you've earned your doctorate, you have uh, submitted a thesis, depending on the environment, whether it is an American, uh, European, Asian, or African system, you either do a defense or what we call viva in certain parts of the world. And then, so any opportunity you, you pursue after then is called a postdoc position. For the sake of this presentation, you hear me interchangeably use postdoctoral position, postdoc position, or postdoc fellowship. So it is an opportunity for actually for academics to continue their research while also gaining experience in their relevant field. So in your PhD, you have uh, philosophized a certain thesis and then you want to continue your research in that field. And so you, you take on these uh, temporary academic positions because it is not a permanent position and you can't be a postdoc for life. So you continue your research and then you also gain experience in your field. So postdocs usually work under the supervision of a principal investigator, which we call PIs for short and then they collaborate with other researchers in a very broad research group. So the PI has its own research group and its research theme. For instance, my lab is, is, is the soil ecology and health lab. So my, my lab works in the broad area of this kind of things. So a postdoc in my lab will be working with PhD students, other postdocs, research assistants and uh, masters and undergrads who are doing their final year project in my lab. So that's how it works. So they research a project that either their mentor or PI has pre-specified or one that they create by themselves. When we looked at when we look at the different kinds of fellowships, postdoc positions, uh, we and then the, the the when I show you the the way to apply for them, you will see that there are two kinds. There there are postdoc positions where, for instance, in this season when our our, our undergraduate students are on break, it's a season where there are grant calls. Where as a as a PI you apply for grants, and in that grant uh, application you put in salaries for postdocs, either uh, entry-level postdocs or senior postdocs, those that have more than three years experience, or even a research fellow, those that have more than four to five years experience. And then you put in those salaries into the budget of the grant. And once you are fortunate to have your grant approved, then you can advertise and recruit for such positions. So that is a, a postdoc position that the PI or the mentor has already pre-specified the research that will be conducted. In that case, you come into a research where there are defined deliverables and milestones that will be achieved and then you specifically focus on achieving the goals of the position. There are other postdoctoral fellowships that we'll see later that you as the candidate will apply for the project. So you get the leeway to specify what you want to do depending on the scope and the area that the call document will specify. There are global ones like the Marie Curie uh, Fellowship, which is very great because the salaries are good. I will talk later about how you need to I'll actually check what you are entering into before getting it. But the ultimate game, the ultimate objective or the goal of a postdoc position is to publish your research findings. Just yesterday, I, we were having a get-together get meeting for one of uh, my friends that is leaving a particular group. He got a permanent uh, position and uh, I got the chance to interact with new postdocs and they ask for advice. One of the things I told them is, as a postdoc, if you want to proceed on, uh, apart from the grace, 
you if you want to proceed on in academia you should publish at least at least at the minimum two papers in a year and they were wondering because they are just new fresh off their phds they are wondering where they are going to get the data i said well you have not finished publishing everything in your phd and this is the time to take time to to work on it because it's competitive as we'll see, see later the the academic positions are not so much available for people so if you want to really get there you must make yourself competitive and that's one of the ways so you publish the research findings and in in addition to research postdocs often take on senior tasks like even mentoring other graduate students i i i say that if you have such opportunity as a postdoc in a a group you should take it on very easily you should take it on because that adds to your your cv so i was uh, saying there earlier that um, we won't call them scholarship positions which i said i made a distinction between uh scholarships and fellowships so scholarships are more of where you are paid stipends which is the minimum amount of money to live by but for postdocs uh, uh for postdoctoral positions you are treated as a fellow more like a worker although it's a temporary position as i said where you be paid salaries so i said they are called uh postdoctoral fellowships or post uh, PhD positions or postdoc positions. So I said earlier that it's, 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 a, it's a temporary academic appointment. You can't be a postdoc forever. Uh, you pursue after earning a doctorate. So it's, it's, it's very important that you have a, a PhD in a field where you have presented a philosophy uh, and uh, you've presented a thesis on that area where you have researched and in in certain parts of the world different uh, examinations happen if you're in the american system they have an exit examination where you do a public presentation similar to what happens in africa especially in nigeria and some african countries in Europe, you have what we call a viva voce, which is from the Italian tradition where you, you it's similar to a public defense, it's just different names for, diff for the same activity. And then, so it is an opportunity for academics to continue their research while also gaining experience in their relevant field. So it's, a, it's, it's always a research, and you, usually you will work under the supervision of a principal investigator or who we will refer to as PIs for short, who will mentor you. And then you have opportunity to collaborate with other researchers within the group in a broad research group. For instance, my lab is the soil uh, uh, ecology and health lab where you will work with other postdocs within the lab you will be able to mentor PhD students in lab group meetings. You'll be able to talk to undergrads who are doing their final year project in my group. And also you talk to master students. You can actually supervise master students. And if you have such opportunity in any lab you are working as a postdoc, it, it, is, it will be very good on your CV because the ultimate goal is to apply for an academic position, right? So you will want to work on building your CV in that area and working on getting those experiences, those supervision experiences, because for academic positions, three things count. Your scholarly publications, the, your scholarly output, uh, that's the quality of your research, the, the administrative duties you have rendered, which will include other things and also teaching. And teaching will also involve supervision of other students. So if as a postdoc you have such opportunity, it will be fine. So as a postdoc, you will research a project that your mentor has pre-specified. I said, 
uh, we will see later when we look at the different kinds of fellowship. There are fellowships, for instance, this period is the summer period. Our, our undergraduate students are on holidays while we are busy looking for money, applying for grants. And in the grants that we are applying, we put in salaries in the budget for either an entry level postdoc, we put in salaries uh, that is uh, those that are just fresh out of PhD, zero to uh, less than three years postdoctoral experience, or senior postdocs more than three years, or even research fellows uh, more than five years experience, uh, uh, post uh, doctoral experience. And then you get those things in, and then you advertise the position, you interview the person, and the person gets employed uh, into the university system on that contract basis. There are also postdoctoral fellowships where you, are, as the candidate, will apply for the project. You specify the, the deliverables and milestones you want to achieve, and you work on the project on your own you apply of course with the agreement of a mentor or a principal investigator who is ready to host you for instance the global Marie Curie fellowship where you can apply the deadline for this year has just passed so but the ultimate goal or the aim of a postdoc position is to publish your research findings and i said i gave example while we were still on google meet that just yesterday i was talking to uh very new postdocs uh in my former pis lab and i was advising them the importance of publication especially if the goal is to end up in the academia you need a minimum at a minimum two publications <laughs> in a year and they were asking me well, they are just starting the project, they don't have data. I said, well, you still have unpublished work from your PhD. This is the time to publish it. If you don't publish it now, as you continue the research career, you're going to have data build up and you will not have things, uh, you not have the time to look back on those. So get them in now, get them published now while you are still within the academia. The length of postdoc is flexible. Uh, you, it, it, it varies, it depends on various factors, including the, the university, the country, the principal investigator, and the money that is available, the available funding. So if, if there is a call for funding, they will specify the duration of the call and they will let you know how, uh, how long it's going to, it's going to be. In addition to research, postdocs often take on senior tasks like mentoring other graduate students, writing grants, and teaching. In fact, one of the things that got me uh, my academic position was the fact that my PI got me uh, teaching classes to teach, and I could include on my CV that I was teaching so, such classes, so such that when I went on for interview for a tenured position, uh, gracefully to God's glory, I got three positions, so I had to choose three, uh, three uh, tenured positions, actually permanent positions as a, as an academic in higher institutions here in Ireland. That's a story for another day because we have very few universities. We have about twelve of them, so if I got three, that's like. A, a quarter of, of, of all the universities I got positions. So I had to choose where to be and I chose to be in Cork. All right, so generally the most, the most positions have two to three years terms and some are extendable depending on the performance and the research required. So the performance will be measured based on key performance indices like how you are interacting with the students the other members of the group, your teamwork ability, how you are able to take initiative, and if the PI likes you and has money, he will extend the contract. Most postdoc positions are in academia, but we will see later that there are some business or even corporate organizations, government departments uh, that that offer postdoc positions across multiple domains like social sciences and the humanities. So most questions I get when I give this kind of talk is, 
uh, is mostly for science people. No, no, no. This is for everybody, including those in the social sciences and the humanities. But it's important to know that a postdoc is often considered as a stepping stone between you being a student. So your student experience ended when you were a PhD student candidate. When you become a postdoc, so the postdoc is like the connecting bridge between that student experience and the full-time professional experience. So it allows you as a PhD holder, as a doctoral degree holder to further your training. So it's a training period and gain skills and experiences that will prepare you for academic career. So some of the benefits of uh, postdoc positions are that they offer you the opportunity for future network and collaborations. I can't count the number of collaborations I have built during my postdoc fellowship position, either through the postdoc funding uh, sponsoring me to attend conferences uh, or collaborating with other people doing interdisciplinary research, getting known in the in the in the publication arena where I can get invited as a guest editor on a journal or even as a, a peer reviewer on certain journals. And you won't, I can't overemphasize the advantages of reviewing for prestigious journals. Once your name is out there, uh, people will always say there is no bias, but I tell you, once your name is already out there, there is no way that when you submit your paper to that same journal that it won't be, it won't be given a fair treatment. So there's opportunities for network and collaborations. You get good amenities for research, maybe things, amenities or equipment that you didn't get to use during your PhD. This is the time, the, the postdoctoral time is the time to train and use those better amenities. It may be better than where you did your PhD. It's also an opportunity to earn money, although the salaries of postdoc, there was an article in Nature sometime last, was it early this year? And uh, it's, it talks about the precarity of uh, postdoc uh, uh, candidates that um, it doesn't uh, it doesn't pay you well. Uh, well, you wouldn't be wealthy on a postdoctoral salary. But as I said, it's an opportunity. You can earn little money, yeah? And it's also a, a time to get professional and career development. So most postdoctoral positions are training positions. So you, the, those are the, the times that you hone in your skills and get better at what you are doing. For instance, one of the rare skills I have is uh, in the area of bioinformatics, taking uh, uh, DNA sequences and uh, analyzing the data, presenting it in such a way that uh, people can understand what is happening within, especially for microbes within an environment. And that is a very rare skill to have. So I got that developed further during my years of postdoctoral training. There are many other advantages that I will not be able to mention now because of time. Yes, as I said, there are different types of postdoctoral fellowships. Number one is academic fellowships. As the name implies, these are within academic institutions. For instance, uh, most universities in the US that I know have uh, funding to take in uh, postdoctoral fellowships. So these are uh, most times uh, for these academic fellowships, apart from the funding coming from the universities, you can also it's, it's, it's also a fellowship that takes place in an academic environment like universities, or if you are in Ireland, there are 
uh, when they have now made them, uh, they, we used to have what we call institutes of technologies. So if 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 you if you are from Nigeria on the call, the Institute of Technologies in Ireland are equivalent of the polytechnics that we have in Nigeria. So, but they have now made them all technological universities now. I think it's only one that is left, but all of them have become technological universities. But the difference between these uh, institutions and the traditional university colleges is that the Institute of Technologies focus more on teaching. So the academics there do very little research while and, and teaching practical skills, uh, technical skills to the students while the universities cover a lot more than the teaching so they do research. Then there are industry fellowships. There are industry fellowships where industries will sponsor you and you can work within the industry, within that particular industry, for instance, those in the food sector, things like Nestle or uh, Glambia, Glambia or Danone. Danone is the maker of uh, this yogurt. I've forgotten. They make yogurts and uh, uh, milk products and uh, butter and all those. They can sponsor you to work within the industry the advantage of the industry fellowship, a big advantage of the industry fellowship over academic fellowship is that once you do a fellowship with an industry, you can easily get a position within that industry. So if you have made up your mind, most times people go for postdocs after their PhD when they have not made up their mind whether they want to remain in academia or go to industry. So if you have already decided that industry is the best place for you, an industry postdoc fellowship will be a very big gateway to getting into that position. There are postdocs within government and public sector departments. So for instance, in Ireland, we have the uh, Economic and Social Research Institute, ESRI. So ESRI in Ireland has postdoc uh, people with PhD who are doing postdoctoral fellowship within those departments as well. It's an opportunity to know people who are working there in government and you can easily transition into such. There are also other international fellowships that have what we call the mobility arrangement. For instance, I was... I was an Erasmus Mundus master scholar. That was for my master's. For Erasmus Mundus uh, scholarship programs, we 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 were uh, we were not allowed to study for the two years in one country. So we the the consortium had partner cons uh, members where you study. For instance, I studied my first year of the master's in Ghent University in Belgium. Then I spent six months in Spain and then six months in Wageningen University in the Netherlands. But this, there are international fellowships like that, postdoc fellowships like that, that will allow you to move within countries. The advantage is that you expand your, your network. You move within, so you don't have a network just within a particular country. And that can lead on to your next role or your next job. But the disadvantage is that if you are uh, looking at settling in a particular country, so it's, it's a bit nomadic in, in the movement. So you won't be settled. But again, as I said, everything has advantages and disadvantages. So the, the advantage is that you get to expand your network between the countries that you visit and the research groups that you visit. The third thing we will look at is identifying the right fellowship. Okay, I've talked about all these fellowships and they sound good. The academic fellowship is good. The, the, there are a lot of opportunities. And uh, the the industry fellowships, I said, the the government or public sector fellowships are there. Now, the first thing you should ask yourself is, 
Does this align with my career goals? So as you are about rounding off your PhD, or as you if you have not done that, as you finish your PhD, you set career goals. Where do I want to be? And those are the kind of questions that we ask. So as I said on the Google Meet, I've sat on both sides of the table and it, feel, it feels like, oh, so this is what could have happened when during my interview, I could already imagine what happened, the decision-making process, while, why I got the positions I got, why I didn't get the positions I didn't get. So um, what are your career goals? Where do you want to be in the next five years? Yes, you want to be a full professor in the next five years, but set defined and achievable goals. So does, if it is a pre-specified fellowship, as I said in the beginning, where the PI had already gotten the grant and is recruiting you based on his budget into the project, does the goals, the milestones and deliverables that are set by the advert, uh, do they align with your career goals? So the, it is very important as well to match the fellowship focus, the focus of the fellowship with your personal research interest. So for instance, uh, I'm an environmental scientist, but I'm focused more on soil and not just soil, the organisms that live within the soil. So if I see a postdoc in say that does about the physical environment, that's not for me. I won't waste my time applying for it. But it is and it's, it's not in my except if, if I'm personally interested in it. But to to guide you, you need to match the fellowship, the focus of the fellowship with your personal research interest. Very important because you, you are, the, the PI will not want to have you take on a position and then after three months you leave the position and he's in a in a in a fix on getting the next person getting the next person he will have to train the person for some time i think um one of the things that is happening currently in ireland is that we we struggle a lot to get uh people to take up positions and the, the reason is not far-fetched because of the cost of living is very high as well. But the the other reason is that you see people who are not really interested. They just uh, uh, talk sweetly at the interview and you say, oh, this is the person for the job. And after three months, the person is quitting, is gone to another road, and you are looking for the person. And the project has a lifetime, as I said. So mo most projects, like we just finished submitting an application for about uh, 700,000 euros now, and we, we want to recruit a senior postdoc on it if granted. But, but that's, that's only going to be for four years. So if, imagine after two years, somebody left, you have to retrain the next person and all that. So it's not what we, uh, people want to do. So at the initial stage, match the, 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 the goal of the focus of the fellowship with your personal research interests and see that, am I really interested? Why am I going in for this? Then how do you assess the fit of a fellowship program? Look at the call document, if it is one that you are applying by yourself, it is very important that you look at the call document. Say, for instance, when the Marie Curie call was on, we, 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 we usually get people who contact us who want to apply to be hosted in our labs or in our institutions. So you want to make sure that uh, you read the call document to see the criteria that are outlined, what is their focus? What are they looking out for? What do they want you to deliver? What are the expected milestones and deliverables of this? And how does that fit with you as a person? The, pers the researcher is as important as the research. The, you can't, I can't overemphasize the, the importance of the researcher. 
the researcher is the person that will be carrying on the day-to-day -day lead on the project. So the person must be really interested in what they want to do and to commit their life for the next two, three years to carry on that research. So there are resources for finding postdoctoral fellowships. There are databases and websites. We'll get to, at the end, I will share uh, some of the websites that I know that are general and some that are specific to, to Europe and uh, uh, Ireland specifically. So there are databases, there are websites that you can, you can look at. The, then you need to network and seek recommendations. For instance, uh, talk to people who have gone ahead. Uh, people are usually willing to help. For instance, I want to help people coming from my background. I have said this in several presentations. I went to a government secondary school at a time that our teachers would go on strike. So I came from the village directly to the university and it was a big university several kilometers away from my village and uh, God helping me to finish well in that university and my curiosity to seek for opportunities and talk to people who I know had gone ahead and network with them opened me up to several opportunities. I can't overemphasize the importance of networking. You might just meet someone at a conference. If you have opportunities to go for international conferences during your PhD, please go for it. Just recently, uh, as part of uh, my remit, we, we have a dual degree program between my university and a university in Beijing in China. So I went to China to teach for two weeks. And then during that time, I visited my, my MSc classmate who is Chinese, who is a professor in the south of China. I traveled all the way from Beijing, the north to the south to see him. And you could see how that had already developed into future collaborations. We are going to talk. I'm going to go back. When I go back to visit China again, I'm going to visit his lab to meet his lab group. And we are going to apply for fundings together. And I can recommend students to go to his lab. If, 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 he's, if, if he has money, he can send me links. So this is what academics do. So once they have a position advertised, they, they send link, uh, they send email to their network. Just yesterday, I got an email from a network I belong of a position in the Netherlands. I am in Ireland, but of a position in the Netherlands because of my network. Okay, please, if you know anybody, please send this to them to apply and those kind of things. So networking and seeking recommendations cannot be overemphasized. But one thing I want to mention here is don't limit yourself to a certain country. For instance, you are in Ethiopia and then uh, I will use Nigeria as an example because that's where I know most. You are in Nigeria, most of the people, the countries they know are the UK, Canada, US. Probably very pe few people will talk about Australia, New Zealand. These are silent countries that there are a lot of opportunities that are, are waiting to be filled and uh, positions that you can apply. But people don't think of, when they think of uh, postdoc positions abroad, they think about the UK, Australia, and uh, sorry, UK, US, and Canada. But think of the Nordic countries. The Nordic countries like Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Finland, these people have positions and you, you can explore, you can't imagine how good it looks on them because of the emphasis on equality, diversity and inclusion to have you from Asia, from Africa in their labs. 
they will be very happy because it looks good on their institution that they are encouraging diversity and inclusion. Number two, know where you are going. Research on the whole country. What is the cost of living, for instance? <laughs> if someone can get excited, okay, is a, a, an entry level postdoc salary in Dublin, in Ireland, is 43,000 euros per annum. And someone in Nigeria might convert that to, 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 to Naira, and they are talking about millions of Naira. And uh, every month you're getting close to let's say, 4 million Naira, but you will not be spending that money in Naira. The cost, research on the cost of living in Dublin before you get excited about it and that you pay tax because you are no longer a, a, a student on scholarship. You are paying tax as a worker. You are a salary earner. But one of the advantages of Ireland, I would say, uh, 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 even though it's expensive, the pathway to becoming a citizen is very clear and well-defined. So in, as a postdoc, you come in with a critical skills uh, work permit. You hold that for two years, then you become, you get a permanent residence. And after five years total of your living, you can apply for a naturalization as a citizen, if that's your goal. Then, also, read the adverts properly. Read the adverts properly. I've sat at interviews where the candidates know nothing, next to nothing about what they have applied for. And you will begin, to, it's, it's a waste of your time and my time to come on an interview where you know next to nothing about what you are applying for. You just saw the position and you do a blanket application. No. Read the adverts properly. What are the specific things they have, they have specified as the uh, um, uh, eligibility, the requirements that are desirable, those that are essential? If you can know those, and then you can already have a mock interview and know what to expect at the interview. Where can you search? For most academic fellowships uh, that are pre-specified, like I said, I gave example of the grants we apply for that we put in the budget uh, positions for either a junior po entry-level postdoc or a senior postdoc or a research fellow. On the institution's website, the job vacancy website, for instance, if you just go to Google and type job vacancies at UCC, uh, that's where I work, University College Cork. You can now filter that into the research vacancies and you see that every Friday they update the website on, on um, the various vacancies available. So when I was uh, a postdoc and looking for the next role, so when, when I, uh, my first postdoc was for two years at the University of Limerick, so when it, it was six months to the end and I was looking for the next role, every Friday I go to different institutions. Since I wanted to remain in Ireland, I go to different institutions in Ireland on their website, job vacancies in this filter and see if there is anything for me that I can apply. The other way is social media. You are in a particular discipline, say you are in engineering, mechanical engineering. Who are the big players in, in your discipline? Do you uh, uh, follow them on their uh, Twitter account, Twitter, former Twitter, now X, their X account? Like for me, there was a particular guy in the Netherlands, Stefan Gaysen. Stefan is, is a big name in when it comes to soil ecology and uh, soil health. And every time on his Twitter, I was always searching his Twitter post because he would be posting opportunities. There was a time he posted about an opportunity in the US in 2020, and I did uh, get off a, off a postdoc position in um, University of Wyoming, which would have been great, but yeah, and there were other plans and uh, I got a uh, different positions here. So I, and you know, 2020 COVID and all that. 
and all that. So search their Twitter accounts. There are other ways that we can all look for these positions. Then the application process. You need to take time to prepare your application material. The key components of the application material are your CV, your cover letter, your research proposal, if it is the, a fellowship that you are applying by yourself. I will keep and I will answer questions on this if you have any question later. And when I show you the examples, I will tell you which ones are the fellowships that are where you can get fellowships that you have to write a proposal for the pre-specified fellowships, the PI already have written the proposal, so there is no need for a proposal in that area. Your CV is very important. So for this, you need to read the advert. What are the essential criteria they have listed? And make sure that you use those keywords in your CV, your cover letter. If, for instance, they are looking for skills in um, R programming, R, R is, uh, is, is, very, is, is, is a data analytical tool, very good. You produce beautiful images. You can integrate it into any, any publication and all that. So if they are looking for that, in your make sure they, they are looking for teamwork. Make sure you use those key terms because now, Sometimes we use CV scanner to determine who is shortlisted for an interview. And what the CV scanner is told is, these are the keywords we are looking for. And then it scores the, the CV based on that. And if you are in the green, you are eligible to be invited for interview then if there are so many people in the green and you don't have time to interview so many people you invite you, you now look for another criteria to invite the the pre specified number of people maybe five people maybe there are 75 applications five people you will need to invite for interview and then select one at the end so this is how competitive it is and that is why you need to avoid any display of incompetence so as I said already, use keywords from the advert in your CV and cover letter. Don't have spelling errors on your CV. Make sure that sometimes we, we can't see our own errors. So you can allow other, another pair of eyes to have a look at your CV. They will be able to spot it spot it very quickly than you who has been used to the CV. You think this is what you have spelled, but you have made a mistake in the spelling. So it is very important that you, you don't open someone's CV and then there are spelling errors already, grammatical errors and all that and all that. So use a, a CV that is free of any, of any display of incompetence. Don't use generic CVs or a, what I would call a one-size-fits-it-all CV. What that means is every, uni every application will require a unique CV. That is why it takes time to apply. It takes time to apply for positions. It's not something that you just sit down and cook up. And I must say this at this point that ChatGPT, Copilot, they are good AI tools that have come to stay. But please don't lift what has been written directly by ChatGPT or Copilot, which is a Microsoft version of, uh, of ChatGPT, into your CV or into your cover letter. For instance, so, uh, uh, late last year, my colleague and I, we got an email from... Uh, uh, a student in America. Well, this is not a postdoc, but this student wanted to come to our lab for, for a PhD position. And you can clearly see that this was written by ChatGPT. For instance, the write-up say, uh, dear, and then he did not edit it. He said, you know, the way ChatGPT will, uh, will uh, give you a generic letter and say, 
please insert the name of the professor here. And that was exactly what he lifted and sent to us. So please and please don't use generic CVs. Tailor the CV and the cover letter to the specific application you are making. I can't overemphasize that. If you get invited for an interview, that is excellent. Prepare well. Once you get invited for an interview, it shows that you are in consideration, you are in contention for that position. And the only thing that will get you that position is your ability to stand out. So prepare well for an interview. Look at it like a date. So an interview is like they, they want to, uh, like when, when you are going on a date with a lady and uh, you, or, or a guy, you, you want to look your best, you want to smell your best, you want to give the best impression. As they say, first impression matters. So you when you come for the interview, make sure that you have researched the group, know what they are doing to the extent that uh, we, we had an interview recently and uh, uh, one of the candidates was asked the question, what, what do you know about the group? Say, no, nothing. <laughs> that is the worst answer to give at an interview. He wasn't considered for the next uh, uh, stage of the interview. Please also avoid irrelevant questions at interview. At every interview, either for a postdoctoral fellowship or for an academic position, at the end of the interview, you are going to be given an opportunity to ask questions. Avoid turning the interview to your own interview and start saying, oh, you have 10 questions. The wrong thing to do is to ask a lot of questions. Another wrong thing to do is to have no question at all. Have maximum three questions. Two, three questions uh, that are well-crafted. Avoid the relevant questions like, um, uh, what project are you working on currently? It's your job to search that and find out not asking them, uh, so so what equipment do you have in your lab now? Or what is your latest publication on? These are obvious things that you can, you should have found out. So avoid such questions. Know about the group, what they are working on, and how that links and integrates with your own research goals. Well, these are not without challenges. Postdoctoral fellowship opportunities are bound, but there are challenges. As a postdoc, one of the things you, you try to juggle is a work-life balance. So as I said to those uh, fresh postdocs yesterday, they are just coming from their PhD. They have the postdoc research to carry out, and I was suggesting to them that they need to publish papers and for 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 most of us that are coming from Africa at the level of postdoc, we have families. You want to balance your research life with your family. So the work-life balance is a big challenge for a postdoc. So I will tell you uh, uh, so solutions that I suggest. Another uh, challenge is research pressure. So the pressure is on you. You have these to do uh, sometimes uh if 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 you are in a in a with a pi that is a workaholic we want to involve you we're discussing one pi yesterday who will call you in the in, in, in have no boundaries at all uh, call you at any time of the day that he or she feels like and uh, all that so the pressure is there the pressure to deliver is there for the research and that can affect your mental health as well. Then there is also the challenge of the job market competition. See all these people gunning for the same goal and only one person will get it. So those are the major challenges. One of the ways that I have been able to manage this is through my time management. 
time management is very important to the littlest thing that you do. For instance, this is what I do. When I come right from my days as a PhD student, when I come to the office in the morning, I write out the things that I want to achieve that day. I write them out, list them out. And once I have done it, I tick the one I have done. That gives a reward system, supplies dopamine to your brain as well that you are achieving something. Unlike when you come into the lab, you, you just, anything goes, anything that you see you want to do. No, no, no. That careful planning, preparation, and prioritizing things that need to be achieved. So what are the things you need to do in the short term? What are the things that need to be done in the short term and in the long term? And that will determine your priority. So those are the things you need to do. So you need to plan your time very well. Time management is very important. You need to also build for yourself a support network. So don't be an isolated person. I used an example. There was a postdoc uh, somewhere I won't mention. And um, uh, the, the group was complaining about him, being, although it was his personality to be on the quiet side. But when people are eating lunch together, he likes to eat alone and all that. I understand that from a personal perspective, if that's your person, fine. But you need to build a support network. It is very important that you interact with everyone in the group. They are tedious. There are people who are difficult to work with. I understand that, but try to be have people that you can fall back on. Make sure that you get support when you need them from your PI. It is not a wrong thing to ask a question about something you don't know. Most of us feel like, oh, the PI is going to see me as someone who does not know anything. Please, instead of struggling on a particular matter for ages, working on, a, maybe you are trying to, uh, to, uh, to write a script or a code, and then uh, meanwhile, it's ju just a meeting with your PI can solve that. So make sure that you have that in mind. Build a, a, a support network that can support you. Then seek mentorship. Seek mentorship. It could be your direct PI if you are comfortable or look for someone who you are comfortable with in the institution and build a support network. The advantages are numerous. They can pull you up. When you, you when you seek mentors, your mentors will look out for you. They will make sure that they, you get what you want to get in terms of positions. When they see adverts, they will they will guide you and tell you, okay, this is how I I this these are the things I did to get me to where I am. And if you want to be in the same place, you can follow similar steps. Or this and these are the things you can do. They are the, the mentors for me, they helped me a lot because they showed me, okay, the ropes to climb the ladder. They showed me, okay, you need to have some teaching because I was basically focused on research. They say, oh, you need to have some teaching experience. And I even did some volunteer teaching. So when, when I was a postdoc in Chagas, the Irish Agriculture and Food Authority, I, I I applied for an academic position. I got interviewed. I got offered the position then, but I realized that it was a maternity cover for a lecturer who was on maternity leave. And so I, I couldn't leave my, because the duration of that contract was nine months. Meanwhile, I had more than two years left on my postdoc. So I, I couldn't leave, but my mentor advised me to reach out to the head of the department to see that I can offer the teaching part-time on just one day. They can arrange the classes. They can arrange the classes one day in a week. I can do that. And the head of the department liked the idea. They arranged the classes. It was an MSc class. They arranged the classes only on Friday for four weeks. And I thought that, and that got on my CV and is part of the things that uh, pushed me to where I am today. So seeking mentorship is very important.
So I was mentioning a lot on the websites that are available. The first website that I mentioned here is Nature Careers. So when you click on Nature Career Jobs and you, you filter to postdoctoral, it helped me a lot to look for positions. In 2020, when my contract was ending with the University of Limerick, I was looking for postdocs. From Nature Careers, I got, uh, I got interviews in Switzerland, in Denmark, in the US, where I told you I got uh, uh, that position from uh, Stefan Geising's uh, Twitter page and all that. So Nature Career is very important to look at. ScholarshipDB.net, you can filter it based on country. ScholarshipDB.net is great because you can filter based on country. You can filter based on discipline, and then it will give you all the adverts. Jobs.ac.uk is for uh, positions in the UK. It covers both PhD, postdoc, and academic positions in the UK. They, they, they are called, uh, postdocs are called, sometimes called research associates in the UK. Then higheredjobs.com is for American institutions. So you can filter again based on discipline. And uh, academicpositions.com is another one. Universityvacancies.com is for Ireland. For Germany, there is the Humboldt Foundation. And uh, these are these are uh, opportunities that are less tapped. Recently, I had uh, one of, of my friends from, from my degree days contact me. He got he works in a in a, a higher education institution in Nigeria. He got a Alexander van Humboldt Fellowship. He's in Germany currently for the next three years, and uh, he's going to get. Uh, uh, get that research experience and that will open more doors for him. So these are just a few of the websites. As I said, you can go on, the, search out the institutions you want. Do you want to go to, let's say, um, uh, uh, a university, say University of British Columbia in Canada, UBC, you go to their website, job vacancies, postdoc vacancies in UBC, and then it will display the list. You will see the deadlines, work on, on your application and submit. If you want to go to US, let's say uh, University of Minnesota or, or Penn State University, PSU, postdoc uh, research associates or whatever, you, you search that and then you get the opportunities are limitless. Just to round off, in Ireland, we have the Irish Research Council, which funds, uh, there are two types of uh, fellowships. There is a PhD fellowship by the, the Irish Research Council. Uh, and then there is also a postdoc fellowship. The postdoc have two streams. There is the art, humanities, and social science stream. And there is the STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics st stream. And it could either be for one year or two years. And this is one of the ones where you can apply uh, uh, for the project yourself. Is what the uh, Irish Research Council and Marie Curie Fellowships, you apply for the project, you write the proposal yourself. The Environmental Protection Agency in Ireland also sponsors uh, a lot of PhD. The EU for the Europe as well, there is Horizon Europe fellowships. There are many Horizon Europe projects that are looking for postdoctoral fellowships because in the application for Horizon Europe, you would have indicated in your budget whether you want to recruit a research assistant, a postdoc, or a senior postdoc, or a research fellow. In Ireland, there is the Department of Agriculture, Food, and Marine for those in, the, in that sphere of research. Uh, in collaboration with the Irish Agriculture and Food Development Authority called Chagask. Uh, Chagask is T-E-A-G-A-S-C, but we pronounce it as Chagask instead of Tigask. And uh, so they have, if you go to Chagask job vacancies, you see a lot of their positions. They don't just recruit postdocs, they recruit research technologists, they recruit um, so Chagas is the equivalent for those of you of us in agriculture from Nigeria. 
It's the equivalent of the IITA, Institute of uh, International Institute of Tropical Agriculture. So they have centers all over the country. Ireland is a small country, but they have centers all over the country dedicated to certain research. There is a crop environment and land use program. There is the animal and grassland innovation research program. There is a food research program and different uh, uh, research uh, centers around the country. And they have research technologies, research technicians, postdoctoral positions, research officers. Also the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency and Science Foundation Island, they sponsor a lot of fellowships. The Marie is Curry Actions Research Fellowship Programs. There is the Individual Fellowship. There is the Global Fellowship. There is the Partnership Fellowship where you spend 18 months in, in a university and 18 months in the industry. So this is, this is one that you can mix industry fellowship with academic fellowship and it gives you the leeway to decide where you want to be. I believe that's all I have here for you today. And I want to thank you for your attention at this stage, and I will take any questions.